Hi, I'm Brian Welch. I'm the publisher of Mother Earth News, and uh, it's my great pleasure and honor today to be spending a little bit of time with Miles Olson. Miles is a philosopher and writer and hunter, and uh, has a couple of years ago wrote the book uh, called uh, Re Unlearn Rewild. Unlearn Rewild, and his new book coming out very soon is The Compassionate Hunter. Right. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Miles. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Good to see you. You too. So let's talk about the compassionate hunter and the whole, I the whole idea of a compassionate hunter. I'm, um, I'm a farmer, you're a hunter, I'm a hunter, and I talk to a lot of people who sort of feel that the act of killing is always a sort of anti-compassionate mm -hmm. act. Do you get that? And do people, do you, do, you, do you find yourself in a lot of conversations of that kind? Yeah, I think initially when I thought about writing a book about hunting, I never really wanted to write a book about hunting, but the idea of hunting and compassion, they're kind of paradoxes, right? Yes, absolutely. Because you're killing something, you're taking its life, it never did anything to harm you, and yet I think intrinsically connected to the act of hunting is this deep reverence for the animal that you're killing, because you're not just killing it, you're taking it into your body. You know, it's not just killing something, it's this transformational process where you you kind of become it and it becomes part of you. And that sounds kind of mystical, but it's also obviously physically what happens when you kill something and eat it. Um, so. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a physical reality as well as kind of a philosophical reality. Yeah. When you say that feeling of respect or compassion or reverence is intrinsic, do you think it's intrinsic to every hunter? Um, to every hunter's experience, I mean. No, not necessarily, no. Hunting, there's nothing inherently good or bad about it, I don't think. It's just a superficial act, right? So it's, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's like tying up your shoes. It's something that we're just doing physically. So it, like how present you are with your awareness and how open you are with your heart, that is completely up to the individual and that shapes the experience, right? For sure. Which is why I would want to write a book that kind of shares that that perspective of hunting. So how does that, how does it feel to you? You go out and you kill a deer and you, then you skin and prepare it. I mean, what's your, what's your emotional state while that's happening? Um, well, I only want to enter that, that process if I'm feeling really clear, if I'm feeling really kind of centered and grounded and a sense of inner peace. I know that whenever I've gone hunting, and there's conflict in my life, and there's always conflict in our lives, that's, that's life. But when it's been some kind of searing, tumultuous thing going on, it's a disaster. So I, I only want to enter that state when, when I'm really open and clear and everything, yeah. ev kind of open to the whole experience. And you know, even just from a safety perspective, I've talked to hunters who are like, yeah, I had an argument with my wife, I forgot to turn the safety on, or something like that, you know? Oh yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's something that the more that I hunt, I don't necessarily feel that I get uh, desensitized to the seriousness of right. killing something. It, uh, it's still a big deal, you know? Yeah, I've, I find the same thing. I mean, I, we hand slaughter about 40 to 50 head of sheep at my house mm. every fall with a group of Muslims who are my customers. Mm. And they always pray, you know, at intervals throughout the process. And I find that, you know, bringing some kind of meditation or prayer into the ritual really helpful mm -hmm. in staying clear and, and grounded and, and feeling the thing mm. the right way so that you don't end up at the end of the experience with a bad taste in your mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I, yeah, I think I, I think I understand what you're saying. Is the book, do you think, for hunters? Is it for people who are skeptical of hunters? Is it just for anybody with an interest in nature? Who, who, sh who do you think should read it? Um, I think all of the above. It's, it's interesting because part of it is just a, a physical how-to on how to hunt um, in a very kind of reverent, respectful way. But then another side of it is a very kind of philosophical exploration into that, that paradox of killing and reverence and, uh, and respect and, and treating life as something that's sacred. Um, and that's something that hunters, a lot of hunters need to, to have awakened 
and it's a, something that everyone just wants. I think most people who are interested in homesteading or gardening or hunting or foraging, they're interested in having a connection to something that's amazing and beautiful, which is the living world. So, so that's, that's the focus of the book. Hunting is the vehicle, but this different way of relating to life is, is what's behind it. Well, on the connection, do you feel like as over your years of, of, of repeating this experience, has there been an evolution? Do you still feel about it or feel the experience of doing it the same way you did the first time you ever went hunting? Um, at, at its core, probably, yeah. 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 I mean, the, the feelings are the same. The intellectual stuff changes. Right. But the feelings are fundamentally unchanged. The difference is the more skills you build, the m I mean, in a sense, having skill and having that clarity and having all of that stuff solid is kind of like a prayer because it's a way of respecting the animal. The more you understand it, the, the cleaner the shot, the more you can use of its body. That's all a way of honoring it, right? So For sure. But in a way, exercising your compassion is based on your skill at doing mm -hmm. the thing that you're doing. Yeah. The quicker you can do it, the more mm -hmm. decisively you can do it, yeah. then the more compassionate the act can be. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're vegan, if you were vegan, and you never ate flesh, would your life be, do you think, more compassionate than it is as this kind of woodsman um, roaming the woods, taking other lives to support your own? Tough question, really. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, because I'm not the person that writes the rule book of ethics or compassion or whatever, right? But you have a viewpoint. Yeah, I do have a viewpoint, and I think um, one who has their hands stained with blood, so to speak, um, it's easier to point out the violence in that. It's easier to see someone who kills an animal and say, whoa, that's violent, that's harsh. Um, at the same time, they understand the whole process. They, they're accountable to the whole process because they're intimately part of it. Yeah. Um, are there whereas, ways, in, are there, I'm oh, sorry, go on. Well, if someone's a vegan and they have a clean conscious, clean conscience getting their food from the store. Well, it's, you know, it's, you don't really know where that food's coming from. You don't have the same honest connection. One of the things I say to people is that in my natural pastures or in the woods where Miles hunts, there's thousands of different living things carrying on their lives. It's a complex ecosystem mm -hmm. where there are lots and lots of niches, some of them very small with lots of things live. Yeah. And then next door to my house, there's a soybean field. And one thing yeah. lives in the soybean field, yeah. and that's a soybean plant. Mm -hmm. And so that, in fact, a, a diverse diet, uh, if, if uh, chosen in a conscientious way, can actually create more room for more living things yeah, if we're preserving a natural environment um, through uh, the me me means in which we gather our own sustenance. Yeah, and it, in that sense, I write this in the book, and it's really interesting because it's another paradox, but to kill a wild animal for food versus to cultivate that protein as soy is actually, if you just look at the energy of the land, the only time you're disturbing the life force when you hunt the deer is when you kill it. Right. And what, for the soybeans, you have to disturb the life force from beginning to end, and you still kill the plant at the end. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think that's a very valid, that's a yeah. very valid construct. Uh -huh. And one I don't think I've ever heard verbalized before. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. How'd you get started with this? In your, in your first book, you talk a lot about the kind of um, meditative nature of living alone in a natural environment in a deep, isolated, uh, a deeply isolated way. Um, very unusual uh, lifestyle choice uh, in today's world. What puts you on that path? Um, I guess as a teenager, just being dissatisfied with what the options were presented to me as ways to live and seeing that there was something kind of unsustainable and destructive and that at the core of, of the culture that I was surrounded by. And, and I guess just really wanting to embrace something that felt alive, really, which is nature. That was the most alive thing that I could see. So, so yeah, when I was 17, I just started. I went and lived in the woods by myself for a summer, and it completely changed me, just having that experience of solitude in nature. And so just 
how often did you do it then? How did that evolve? Were you ever out there by yourself for months at a time? What's that first pilgrimage was the biggest kind of chunk of alone time. And then for several years after that, it was, I would spend the summers alone in, in the woods and then kind of come back. And then I learned how to build cabins in the woods eventually. And then I lived with a group, of, a community of other people for about six years. We, we kind of had a communal homestead environment and then and that fell apart and I lived alone again. But throughout all of it, the, yeah, I just feel, people always say, and I guess I believed in my whole life, that if there's something you need to know, if there's some wisdom you need to discover, it's there, it's just inherent in life, it's written into the fabric of life. And for me, connecting to the land has been um, a really amazing way of actually touching that, that wisdom. And how much of that is just time for reflection? I mean, it sounds like for somebody in our society, you've had an unusually large amount of time for reflection compared to the average person. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. How much do you think that sense of connectedness and that sense of inner peace and identity is due to the wilderness setting and how much of, you, of it do you think is just due to the amount of time you've spent in reflection because of the lifestyle? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't really know. I had to quantify it. Maybe 50-50 because I know that people who have a practice of meditation or something, there's a lot of similarities to the experience of spending time just in nature. Um, so I know that there's many paths to the same place. Yeah. Um, but specifically connecting to nature, there's these really amazing lessons kind of entwined in the seasons and in, in a lot of the activities and the rhythms of the land that... I, one of the things that I really like about your writing is the way you communicate your own identification with other living things. Hmm. Like, you know, in a certain state of mind, you describe yourself as feeling like a tree, mm -hmm. as though you understand the stillness and the, the long lifetime and the kind of uh, stationary aspects of living as a tree. Is that, a, is that something that recurs for you in your lifestyle? I mean, is, and do you find that a rewarding thing to be able to identify with, with plants and other animals and the, the kind of diverse web of living things? I find it grounding. Yeah. I think it's inherent in being human is that, um, and this is in a lot of spiritual traditions, it's enforced in a, in a lot of kind of, high science or whatever too, like quantum physics or, or even just deep biology or whatever in ecology. Just the idea that we are separate from the living world is an illusion. Um, and that at, at, a, at a deep biological standpoint or from the physics standpoint, we're actually, we're, we're part of this greater whole. We're deeply intertwined and interwoven. So for me, feeling that connection to the land is like a connection to self. It's like a connection to your own core and your own identity, which is really profound. And I think that's why people are so attracted to, to homesteading skills or earth skills or whatever you want to call it, is because it's a way of connecting to a part of ourselves that's really sane and centered and grounded. So it sounds to me almost like you're saying that, that the lifestyle helps you break down a barrier between the self and the universe, mm -hmm. a kind of artificial barrier, mm -hmm. and that w through practice and exercise, that, that barrier, to some degree or another, is, is dissipated. Mm -hmm. So you feel the connection more constantly. Yeah, and, and I didn't get into this lifestyle with this mindset necessarily. You know, I didn't, I, I grew up kind of rejecting a lot of spirituality and religion and stuff because there's a lot of negative stuff that is For bagged sure. up into all of that. But uh, it cracks you open. Just the experience of, of hunting definitely cracks you open. And just spending time close to the land and by yourself, where, where yeah, that, that veil of yourself can kind of dissipate, like you said. It cracks you open to different, different things. So a reflective person like you living a very unconventional lifestyle, What's your ambition for the rest of your life? And what's your, I mean, we, what we're talking about today is a, a lifestyle connected in, in an intimate way to the sacrifices and the deaths 
of other living things so that we can live here. What's your ambition for how the rest of your life is shaped? And then what's your ambition for or your feeling about the end of your own life? Two, two big questions. <laughs> my ambition for the way the rest of my life is shaped. I guess um, going back to seeing patterns in nature and getting inspired by them. I guess in nature I see the, the fundamental pattern of evolution or whatever is is that that's that's what drives life right in the in the forest or whatever ecology you're looking at there's this this kind of evolutionary impulse where things are growing and and sometimes they're declining so that others can grow and there's always this kind of spontaneous diversification and and yeah, just kind in of, every generation right mm -hmm. yeah and this flourishing of life and and uh, and are you doing that? Are you evolving? Yeah, I think so. That's it. Feels that way. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess, but it doesn't have to. Not not necess I mean, even through my path currently involves um, writing books, doing talks, teaching some of the skills that I've been learning, and that feels like part of this evolutionary process for me. It feels like it pushes me to become more clear and strong and centered, and it also just spreads whatever I've touched. Um, it, it allows it to kind of spread and become something less, less isolated. Yeah, so if I could put words in your mouth, I hear you saying that you've found a vocation that you seem to feel helps you grow and takes you in a direction you wish to grow. Mm -hmm. And so your lifestyle, your vocation, and your spiritual practice are pretty much woven together. Yeah, I feel as they should be for, yeah, for hopefully most, for everybody. Yeah, for every, for every solid spiritual practice, it should be on the ground, you know, on earth where, uh, I mean, and wherever else one connects to, but unless it's translating into your life and how you conduct yourself, then I'm not that, not, not that excited about it. It sounds exactly right. Mm -hmm. So what implication does that have for how a person like you addresses the end of life and what do you think you have I mean, what's your perspective on the fact that one day you um, like all those uh, like all the animals that, that you and I have consumed in our lifetimes mm -hmm. uh, one of these days we uh, are going to be in the position of being consumed mm -hmm. you have any reflections on how your perspective might be different than the average perspective on that. Yeah, maybe it would be. I mean, the act of hunting, especially if you're being open to all the different layers of it, it, it brings you into contact with death and it brings you into contact with that transformation because when I, whenever I've killed a deer or whatever it is, um, I'll give an example of once I shot a deer and it dropped dead right, right there where I shot it, like 20 yards away from me. and. Uh, I had hit it in the spine and I, I walked up and I, I, I had to give it some time for, for no, no ceremonial reason that I had been taught or anything. I was just a young guy learning how to hunt, but it, it felt as if something had to evacuate the body. Mm -hmm. um, whatever it was that had been previously illuminating the body with life had to evacuate the body. And after a few minutes, there was these rhythmic shudders through the muscles. It was paralyzed, so it wasn't flailing or anything. It couldn't. But there was these rhythmic shudders. And at some moment, it was just like, okay, now it feels okay. And that was just an intuitive thing. I don't, I don't know that you could say that that's anything more than my own imagination. But um, I don't think that we die with our bodies is, is what I guess I'm getting at there. And that's based on my observations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you think that something of you goes on. Does it go on in a collective way, in the way the deer is now part of you and you're part of a lot of other people and the whole thing is sort of woven together? Or does Miles, the individual, survive death? Well, a lot of Miles, the individual, is just Miles, uh, this little fragment of me that I 
call myself and that I understand. And then there's this unconscious that's the rest of me, right? Right. Um, and really, you know, the afterlife is a mystery to me as much as it is to anyone. But just based on my observations and, and my reflection, um, the, I feel like, yeah, the part of us that lives on is, is bigger than that little, that little part. <laughs> and yeah. it might have a good, good laugh at that little part. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well... Uh, just judging by this conversation, I think you do have a, a different a different perspective on life and death than the average person. And mm -hmm. I've learned a lot, kind of inspired by what you've what you've shared. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate all of you all listening in. Uh, again, I'm Brian Welch, and uh, we're broadcasting a little interview for Mother Earth News. I'm with Miles Olson, and his books are Unlearn Rewild and soon to be The Compassionate Hunter. Yes. The Compassionate Hunter's Guidebook. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. The Compassionate Hunter's Guidebook. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.